Hello, Nancy. Hi, happy birthday. Oh, yes. It is It is my birthday on the day we're recording this. Um, thank you. I You're guess welcome. That's the right thing to say. <laughs> uh, so we were talking uh, before we started recording about uh, birthdays, and the episode today is kind of about bad omens and things like that. But we were wondering, has anything bad happened on our birthdays? Not really to us or on the exact date, but like what's our... Day yeah. So it just so ha- yeah. Number, I guess number. Yeah. Number. So it just so happens on my birthday, a couple interesting things happen, and one of them I do recall. But so actually, it was the, before I was born. It was the date of so, the Watergate break-in. So you're not that old. Not that not quite that <laughs> old. Um, but what I do remember when I turned, I believe it was 16. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the day that there was the chase with O.J. Simpson, and then he got arrested. Oh my gosh. Yeah, with the white Bronco. Oh wow. Yeah, we were having That's... a party at my friend's house. In high school, and I'm like, um, like watching that party? on television. Yeah, you know, like everyone was watching that. So yeah. wait, you were at a you were at a birthday party for myself, for yourself, watching yep. the wow. That's like, yeah, I don't. So do you, do you think that's like personally affected you? Were no, you like, I don't this, think this so. But I just my... I just remember that, like, oh, that happened on my birthday. Oh man, which is I think, interesting. I think that counts. Yeah. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. I can't... (laughs) Of all the things I would have imagined that would have happened like on a date, that wouldn't have been it. Like, I can't believe that happened on your birthday. I know. It's crazy. Um, It's interesting. (laughs) All right. Well, we're not here to talk about your birthday, my birthday, uh, anything like that. But I did mention we are here to talk about, in some respects, bad omens. And to explain this episode, uh, our our producer for this one, we're going to bring in Liza Lester. Hey, Shane. Hi, Liza. I guess I could have said hello. I don't know why I awkwardly paused there. Anyways, so yes, what are we here to talk about today? All right. Well, we're going to talk about volcanoes. I like volcanoes. And also the Ides of March. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Isn't that something Shakespeare? That's right. It's Shakespeare. Wait, how how is it? It doesn't matter. Keep going. Okay. This will be forever if we keep doing this. (laughs) This will be a side side episode. (laughs) All right. So we're talking about omens and momentous events. And 2,000 years ago in 44 BCE, uh, there was a volcano that erupted somewhere in Earth. And we know this because of ice core records. Remember ice cores? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've done stuff on ice cores. We've done stuff on ice cores. So the ice cores recorded like large amounts of sulfur and particulates from somewhere in the world there was a volcano. But we don't know where. But we know that it was big and somewhere near the equator. Also in 44 BCE, Caesar was assassinated. Remember that? The Ides of March. Ides of March. <laughs> exactly. I got it. Oh, it's Shakespeare because it's a play, right? That's right. Julius Caesar. <laughs> I like that we keep going back to Shakespeare. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly none of us can quote it. No. Okay. So also in 44 BC, um, Mount Etna, which is on Sicily, you know, down at the boot in Italy. Mm-hmm. So kind of right in the middle mm-hmm. of the time, the, the Roman Republic at the time, which kind of extended all the way around the Mediterranean. It also erupted. But... You know, volcanologists hadn't thought these things were related because that eruption didn't seem to be that big. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I see where this is going. Yeah. But, I mean, it was big enough that you know, it was effects in Rome. And these effects happened to be rolling in right around the time that Julius Caesar was assassinated. So, kind of bad omens, right? There we go. Yeah, yeah. I like bringing it all back together. Right. Okay. So, and, and, and writers of the time recorded these effects. So, for example, here is classicist Morgan King reading a description from an eyewitness that is Virgil, the kind of rock star poet of the Roman era <laughs> in the Augustan period. <laughs> he was, though, like, <laughs> in, in the Augustan period, which was, Augustus was the first emperor of Rome. So, he was Julius Caesar's heir and adopted son. Um, and so, uh, he t- kind of took over in that turmoil after his death. And Virgil wrote this really big poem about farming and weather. <laughs> uh, and this is from that poem. We were talking about uh, poetry. Poetry. Wait. Okay, I can I can read you the, the, the Virgil lines. Ile at etiam extincto miseratus Caesare Romam 
cum caput obscura nitidum verugene texit, impia que aeternam timuerant saecula noctum. So these are a couple of lines from Virgil's Georgics, the, the farming poem. When Caesar had died, even the sun uh, pitied Rome. When it covered its head with dark shadow and the impious generations feared eternal night. Yeah, that's that's dramatic. Yeah. It's it's a mood. It's and I think it does get, you know, this idea the line, you know, really strikes me in light of our project, you know, that the impious generations feared eternal night. I think that captures something of this experience of you know, suddenly you you can't see the the sun Will and it you come back. Yeah, how do you know? <laughs> Uh, and you know, we think it actually probably took like a year or two for things to actually really go back. So that's a long time. It's a long time, and you don't know why it happened necessarily, and you know, there's no way to know when it'll be over. So I think it is a really dramatic experience. So yeah, I guess this makes <laughs> makes sense if your if your leader was just killed, the skies turned black. There's there's you could see why that would be a little bit ominous. Or I, I, I could at least. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> seem like, you know, especially if you're tending to see portent in astrological events and things happening in nature. And the idea was, I think, among classicists and historians that poets of the times were really describing that mood in Rome and they were attributing to the natural world the feelings of the people and reflecting that mood, like metaphorically, which which does make sense because they, as we were saying, they did see um, they did see omens and they did see portent and sim- symbolism in what was going on in the natural world. But Morgan's saying that maybe they were also literally describing what was going on, right? Mm-hmm. And that maybe some of this kind of environmental disaster that occurred could have been overshadowed by all these political things that were going on, which were pretty dramatic and complicated. Sure, I could see. Um considering our, our current climate like no commentary on that but there's like you could think about yeah there's like other stuff going on in the world but there are certain things that are at the forefront of everything and so what people are paying attention to yeah and there's like a lot of writing about that and like all the really complicated like backstabbing events going on in all directions mm-hmm. um but after these darkened skies came several years of cold do we know this from tree rings remember tree rings oh yeah, yeah this we... is all this is like this is like our review episode right so like <laughs> frost damage and trees that are really long lived showed that it was cold um and there were records like financial records of trade being impacted and like famine and maybe they thought the famine was from warfare but mm-hmm. morgan and some other researchers were about to bring in looked back at other records, you know, not just in Rome, but like extending as far as China and Southeast Asia, where there was famine, there was crop failures. They noted that people were burying all their gold. (laughs) That's what you do when things are bad. Sure. Um, And and evidence that like these problems weren't just in Rome, but were extending perhaps, perhaps around the world. Wow, that's intense. Yeah. So then the question is, could this eruption at Mount Etna have been responsible for all these climac- climactic, climatic, Clim- climate events yeah, that were right. happening. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and so when Morgan was at Berkeley, you know, finishing her degree, um, she worked with a bunch of scientists. And they tried to model whether this volcano in Sicily could have impacted the global climate in this way. I'm excited for this. Yeah. All right. You want to go? Let's start by setting this, the political stage. Okay. So we'll bring in our classicist first. Awesome. Hi, my name is Morgan King. I'm a visiting assistant professor of classics at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University in Minnesota. And I work on Roman culture and literature, uh, and especially of the Augustan era. So this was a big period of transition for the Roman Empire. Yes. What was going on at the end of the Roman Republic? So, a lot. It's a really complex time period, and you have to go back, I think, to fully understand it actually considerably further. So, a lot of Historians will go back to about 
the 120s BCE uh, for the start of a sort of cycle of political violence. Romans themselves will go back even a little bit further to winning the Punic Wars against the Carthaginians because nothing is as uh, damaging to Roman psyche as victory, actually. Uh, Was that like Hannibal coming over the Alps yes, with elephants? Yes, exactly. That wow, okay. Exactly. So um, some, some Roman historians think that actually being too successful is what makes things go wrong. <laughs> Modern historians will oftentimes state the sort of beginning of the fall more to um, the start of actual civil violence in the Republic, uh, really serious civil violence, which starts in about the 120s. And so there are, there are a lot of economic, political, military factors that go into this time period. But basically, to sort of give a, a broad view of it, you get power increasingly consolidated under sort of individual very successful generals and politicians uh, who then end up sort of fighting each other for you know more control over Rome and its provinces so you get a sort of escalating series of both like political violence in the city and also civil wars <laughs> The Roman Empire, they, they did have, they had a representational government, kind of like we do now? No, I wouldn't. Okay. I, so it's, it's interesting and complicated. So they had a republic, which did have, you know, voting rights for citizens. However, the voting rights were stacked towards the wealthy. So it's still, in a lot of ways, oligarchical. So I think oftentimes in pop culture, we think of, like, the fall of the republic as the fall of this like actually democratized form of government. Uh, and it definitely wasn't actually that. It was actually a <laughs> sort of a cabal of elite people, you know, who wanted to maintain that sort of collective elite control. So uh, I wouldn't romanticize the fall of the republic in quite uh -huh. the ways that oftentimes popular culture does. But, you know, on the other hand, you had a sort of wider collection of people who had access to power. Whereas in the empire, it's going to be really centered in this imperial family. And it's going to be you know, really based around a single household. So for Julius Caesar, was he like a popular figure? Like would the mm -hmm. average Roman be kind of like, you know, like, yeah, I support Caesar because this is someone who's very exciting, who I know, who's like out conquering things for Rome. Yeah. So he was a very popular figure. And he, he was actually <laughs> associated with a, a party called the Populares, <laughs> which um, and, you know, some of his political strategies were things like giving away money to, pe you know, the people, which is a thing that will make you popular with, um, you know, lower classes. He also was very generous to his soldiers, um, you know, and he was very successful as a general. So he was able to give his soldiers a lot of money, uh, which made them very loyal to him, which was a very effective political strategy. So he did have a lot of popular support. And we see things like, you know, in his will, he makes a giant donation to the people of Rome. Um, and so that also makes them, um, you know, uh, rouses a lot of popular anger about his, his murder. Uh, and you see, you know, riots at his funeral. So events leading up to his death in 44 BCE, what's going on in Rome in those, those last years? A couple years previously, things had basically come to a head between him and uh, his sort of biggest rival at the time, a guy named Pompey, who actually somewhat funnily was uh, his son-in-law for a while, uh, despite Ooh. being considerably older than Caesar. So he, uh, Pompey was married to Julius Caesar's daughter, Julia, his only living child, um, but she dies in childbirth. And, and shortly thereafter, things sort of disintegrate between the two of them and Pompey and a collection of senators who are very suspicious of Caesar basically start trying to maneuver to try and decrease Caesar's power. Caesar has been on campaign in Gaul and he's supposed to come back and traditionally as sort of a Roman politician, you have to leave your army in the province where it belongs, mm. and then you come back to Rome, and if you want to, you can, you know, 
uh, run for office. And if you get into office, then um, you know you get power. But also, uh, sort of critically, you get immunity from prosecution. Oh, nobody can actually like prosecute you for anything while you're in office. It's funny. This whole question has become like very on point for contemporary <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> politics. Um, but in, in Rome, it's actually you know, a very sort of set thing that you can't be prosecuted while in office. But according to sort of normal rules, like in order to run for office, you have to physically be in Rome. So he has to leave his armies to do that. All right. So in Gaul, which is like mm-hmm. France, France now. France, okay. Yep. You can't bring your army with you into Rome to then run for office with them at your back. Right. So, <laughs> okay. so Caesar doesn't like this situation where uh, he knows that his enemies are going to prosecute him if he is at, you know, if there's a portion of time where he's not immune and doesn't have the power of an army with him. So this is where we get that moment. Um, it's come into sort of uh, popular parlance, the crossing of the Rubicon. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is the moment when Julius Caesar decides that he's just going to take his army with him into Italy, uh, that he's not going to play this game, that he uh, does not want to be vulnerable to his political enemies in that way. Um, and so this starts a civil war with Pompey and the senators who are with Pompey, which they lose. And so Caesar wins. It takes a couple of years, but uh, he manages to break the power of the opposition. But he's also very into this idea of mercy. So he doesn't want to be a king. He doesn't want to be, you know, to totally break the system in Rome. He just wants to sort of have power and safety, uh, or at least that's sort of how he would present it. And so he he doesn't actually kill his enemies. He he pardons basically all of them. He makes this big show of like forgiving them and welcoming them back into the fold if they're willing to sort of, you know, play by his rules. So he does that and things are sort of moving towards a new normal in which he sort of holds all of the power but but ostensibly republican systems are still in place and he sort of tries to you know work out a new system on top of the old system Uh, and one of the ways he does this is he ends up sort of taking this actually traditional role of dictator okay which is actually in like roman history a totally legal normal political role. So it doesn't have this kind of vibe that we give it now. And it gets that, I think, in large part because of what happens with Caesar. (laughs) Um, But traditionally, actually, it's very limited, and it's like to respond to a specific crisis, usually, uh, where they're like, eh, the two consul thing, too dispersed, like not enough power. We want sort of a more centralized executive to deal with this crisis. Um, And so like this sort of model of Cincinnatus is he comes, he wins the war, and then he goes back to his farm. And so, and that, that actually happened, um, like in the Punic Wars against Carthage. And, you know, at other times, Rome had dictators and they, they did the thing and then they, they went home. But Julius Caesar tries to, he decides, well, maybe this is like the closest thing to, to what I want to be is dictator, but like forever. <laughs> um, so he, he, you know, uh, decides he'll be dictator for life. And he, he's sort of trying to pull together a new system uh, on top of the old. Um, but... He did let all of these people who didn't really like him and didn't agree with this vision live. Um, and so they, they start, um, you know, plotting to, to try and end this, um, to try and make things go back to the way that they were, uh, or at least how they think that they were or should be. Um, so uh, that's how he ends up getting assassinated by you know, a group of these people, many of whom had actually fought against him in the previous civil war which is also part of the reason why his grandnephew does not make the same mistake, but instead kills all of his enemies. No mercy. No mercy. Yeah. So that game ends with Julius Caesar. But yeah, so it's a, on the one hand, in 44, before Caesar's assassination, things look somewhat stable for like at least a short amount of time, um, but also moving towards something new. So how long (laughs) was Caesar serving as dictator before he's killed? this like dictator for life position was actually very soon before he gets assassinated. I believe it's in January of 44 and he, he's assassinated in March. So month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah a couple months. Yeah. Um, so it's that role ends up for life, but a very short life was <laughs> yeah. not long. March 15th. The mm-hmm. Ides of March. Ides of March. <laughs> so then what happens after he is killed? Like there's riots at his funeral. <laughs> 
um, trouble across the empire, which extends at this point how far? So Spain, all the way up to, to Gaul, so like modern day France, all the way um, like east into like modern day like Israel. Egypt is not technically a province yet, but it's like sort of tightly intertwined. Um, North Africa, though, is is a province. province. Um, so you've got sort of a, a big circle around the Mediterranean. Um, it's not at a, the largest extent that it will be, but it's uh, a lot of what you think of when you see sort of the maps of the Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, but then Caesar is murdered, and there is trouble. Yeah. So it's it creates a huge power vacuum, and it, it turns out that the 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 assassins. They hadn't really fully thought this through. <laughs> um, so they kind of thought that if they just killed Caesar, it would go back to the way it was. That Caesar was the problem. But Caesar wasn't the problem. I mean, Caesar was part of the problem, but the problem was bigger. The problem was more systemic. And uh, so when Caesar dies, there's a power vacuum and people start competing to you know, take up that power and control that Caesar had held. So, and there are also now all of these like angry mobs and people who really, you know, legions who are very loyal to Caesar, who are really unhappy about how things are. Um, so you see, like on the one hand, you've got the assassins and the sort of senatorial elite who want to reclaim more of their power. But then you've also got people competing to sort of take over Caesar's spot. And there are two main people who do that. Caesar's great nephew, who he names as his heir, a guy named Octavian, later to be uh, dubbed Augustus, and also Caesar's sort of right-hand man in the military, um, a guy named Antony. And it's a sort of interesting generational thing because Antony is sort of in his prime of life. He's a you know a veteran of all of these campaigns with Caesar, uh, really well established, you know, known and trusted by the legions. Octavian slash Augustus is like 17 years old. He's a kid. He's basically at college. Uh, <laughs> and he, he gets the word that his you know, great uncle, who also adopts him as his son in his will. Um, so after that, Augustus Octavian makes a big deal of being the son of Caesar, which is totally normal, actually, for Romans to just adopt people in your will. It, it feels weird today, but that's sort of how things worked. But yeah, so he gets the, you know, the call that his, his great uncle slash father is dead and like, what are you going to do? Um, and so he, he rides into town and says, you know, I'm, I'm going to you know, swing for the fences on this. I'm, I'm going to be the next Caesar. Antony, not so happy about that. Antony thinks he's going to be the one to sort of take up that mantle because, you know, he was right next to Caesar the whole time. So you've got sort of power battles, you know, going both within the Caesarian party and between them and the sort of senatorial classes. So for the next, you know, two to three years, you see uh, a number of both like sort of small scale skirmishing and then all out civil war break out between those three interconnected factions. And eventually uh, Antony and Octavian team up and fight it out with the senators, uh, with um, the sort of famous one in popular culture is Brutus. And so the, at the Battle of Philippi, they, they defeat Brutus and the other senators and um, break that power and uh, sort of come up with their own treaty, what they called a triumvirate, um, mm. where they sort of share power in the empire, the two of them, and then a, a third guy who's kind of there just to keep the peace uh he gets knocked out early um <laughs> and you know, eventually octavian and antony are going to duke it out again and so that's uh if you're familiar with shakespeare the uh antony and cleopatra mm -hmm. that whole saga shakes down in then the 30s uh and eventually octavian defeats antony and cleopatra and then he gets soul control um so it is a sort of like slow moving avalanche of you know and these years are, you know, particularly fraught and particularly, I think, confusing if you don't study them because you do have, uh, there's a lot of double crossing. There's a lot of, you know, 
they're allies, they're not allies. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, one minute, you know, Octavian is seems to be allied with the senators and that senatorial party, and then he's actually back with Antony, and then he's killing Antony. You know, so it's, well, he, Antony commits suicide, but, you know. Uh, yeah, causing the circumstances in which Antony will commit suicide. Yeah, so it is a really, I mean, very Game of Thrones, you know, complex, you know, power vacuum kind of situation. So there was obviously a lot of stuff going on politically at the time, really interesting depending on how, oh, no, interesting things that we've probably learned about in some capacity, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But so Shakespeare. That's Shakespeare. Shakespeare, back to Shakespeare. So that's the politics side of it but what about what about the volcano yeah i mean i was promised a volcano here liza (laughs) (laughs) right the volcano okay so in february this volcano erupts it's february now on sicily oh and this is actually a pretty big mountain it's like 10,000 11,000 feet oh sure it's one of the bigger mountains and it's actually one of the most um volcanically active mountains in europe it's erupted last year in 2019 oh all right the ash cloud hits rome just about like the day after Caesar's assassination, okay. apparently. And so Caesar's assassinated, and the skies turn dark. Like the sun is blotted out from the sky, uh, apparently. So it really, from all accounts to Romans, it felt like a really apocalyptic moment that, you know, all of this crazy stuff was happening, you know, not just in politics, but also in just the world around them you know this eruption and the the sky's turning dark there's also a little bit later um a comet that's seen (laughs) which then gets interpreted actually as caesar ascending into the heavens as a god so he actually yeah so they actually end up believing that he he became a god after his death which then octavian augustus also makes a big deal of so he he spends the rest of his life not just calling himself the son of caesar but the son of caesar the god right okay so this is helping him be like you yes. know i yeah. am like the scion of, of this yeah. god right i am i'm literally the son of a god yeah so it's a really there's a lot happening and a lot of the historians writing at the time you know um poets will will list just the crazy things that happened these years and just how out of control and sort of out of whack the natural world seemed uh, in this moment. Um, And so our project is looking specifically at this eruption of Etna, which, you know, we think caused probably really widespread effects and also could be responsible for a number of different effects that Romans didn't necessarily associate with that eruption. So there were also a bunch of solar effects, which you can get from having you know, aerosols in the atmosphere that sort of mess with how you see the sun. So the famously when Octavian comes to Rome, when he, you know, he's coming back from college and into the <laughs> Rome to try and become, you know, the next Caesar, you know, people see this sort of ring around the sun, this halo. Uh, and that gets interpreted as, you know, sort of, you know, divine favor for for Octavian, that this is, you know, a really, you know, you know, I mean, it seems like a good thing for the sun to have this like giant halo uh, as this young man who's, you know, the heir of Caesar returns, uh, as opposed to the the darkened skies. So the Romans absolutely are interpreting these environmental effects as really meaningful. And, you know, we think that they they are also saying that they go on for a long time. So uh, a lot of the sources say that the sky, the sun didn't shine as brightly for about a year. So I think it's really interesting to think about what that, ex- how that would sh- shape your experience of this moment of political turmoil to like also, you know, go outside and ha- you know not be able to see, you yeah. know, the world as you have remembered it. Even if you know, it's still affecting the way you feel about what's going on. Right? Yeah, like, absolutely. This feeling of. Um, gloom and yeah almost like this guy is grieving right yeah did that, romans at the time know it was a volcano that was creating this this darkness of the skies was it raining ash on rome yeah so that's a really interesting question one of the sort of 
famous in my field descriptions of this comes from uh, the poet Virgil, who is sort of the Roman poet. Um, <laughs> and you know, he, he writes about this in um, this uh, big poem that he writes about farming. And in the first book, it's all about sort of the natural world and weather. And he talks about how the sun pitied Rome when Caesar died. And he talks about how the skies turned dark. And then he moves immediately from that to describing the eruption of Etna. Okay. And he doesn't exactly explicitly say that it's the cause, but the two seem linked in the sort of progression of thought. So I think it's not not totally clear if that they knew Romans, they were cause and effect, but right. they know that they're happening at the same right. time. Right. And they're they're definitely associated. I think the solar effects, um, I don't think there's any clear sense that they're linking that to Etna. Mm-hmm. And we also think that some famines around the Mediterranean probably also were caused by this. And Romans certainly, I think, didn't have a clear sense that that was going to be linked mm-hmm. to Etna either. Um, so I think it's a, another sort of interesting aspect of the, the project that we're working on that you know, the effects of such a gaseous volcanic eruption are so dispersed. They're very dramatic, but they're... You know, a lot of them are happening far away from Sicily. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not just the the rock and fire right there. It's you know, the climactic impact, you know, around the Mediterranean and around the world, the world. even. And so, you know, it changes the the temperatures, and so right. you're getting your crops aren't maturing the way they are expected, and you have famine. Right. And um, presumably, unrest kind of goes along with famine because people are hungry. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing that. So I think a lot of Romans um, were also attributing famine to the political unrest, which, you know, has its own sort of set of causes that Mm -hmm. we've talked about. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it is, you know, you know, I think part of what our project suggests too, you know, maybe there are multiple causes here. Maybe also just like it's, you know, political unrest may also be helping to cause famine and the famine may also be partially, you know, there may not be that much crop to take in anyway because of the weather. Um, so you you have potentially multiple causation, and it I think you know one thing that we're sort of interested in is the way that potentially the the political unrest may have sort of obscured how bad the environmental mm. unrest. So we kind was. of attributed it to this political unrest because it it's so dramatic, right? The time, so how can you stop watching it? Look at this, and they <laughs> right. think, uh, yeah, there was famine because there was war. There was right. We've got a uncertainty. cause, yeah. And you know, I don't want to dis. I, you know, don't want to discount that as a cause, but it's it's possible too that you know there's you know another layer of things happening here that we haven't been able to see as clearly because it was such a tumultuous time period. When you look past Rome to you know, other empires around the world, do you see evidence of this volcano? Yeah, so there is actually evidence also uh, in China of massive famines during these years. So which maps up pretty well with the aerosol uh, mapping that the geologists in our, our team have done. Um, <laughs> and we're going to ac- talk with them about it some more. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, so actually, it really does sort of geographically match up pretty well. Uh, I'm not an expert at all in uh, ancient China, but but we do have uh, records of famines there. Uh, so the, the impact really was Global. Is this the it, first time people have thought about Mount Etna having these effects on the politics of Rome at, at this time and maybe being, you know, a big volcano that had? So actually, no. Interestingly, there was this excellent paper from uh, 1988 by a woman named Phyllis Forsyth. Noah and I had a fantastic conversation with her. You know, she, she did this as a solo project. And so I think you know, she talked about how actually, you know, challenging it was sort of moving into a sort of scientific angle of classics, you know, and that she had to really work to get people to take her seriously. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to just to read and, and understand a whole different field. Like, yes, it's it's an enormous amount of work. So I'm I'm grateful to be working with geologists who <laughs> who specialize in volcanoes. Geologists. We know some geologists. We know a lot of geologists. 
so she talked to geologists, right? Yes. Okay. She worked with them. They did a bunch of modeling. Yes. To match the kind of historical data that she was contributing. Sure. Okay. Well, let's hear from them. I'm Raphael, and I'm an undergrad at UC Berkeley studying atmospheric science. Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm a graduate student at UC Berkeley, and I study volcanoes and climate, specifically the largest volcanic eruptions, which often coincide with crazy climatic effects and mass extinctions. Hi, I'm Tushar. I'm a graduate student at, at UC Berkeley also. I study how volcanoes and climate interact um, on a variety of time scales from a, from a theoretical perspective. Um, trying to understand volcanoes underwater as well as on land. My name's Noah. Uh, I'm a postdoc at NASA, um, but most of this work was done when I was at UC Berkeley studying volcanoes and climate and hot springs. Our study was really seeking to answer two questions. What was the climate and the sort of lived experience of people in 44 BC like? And, and that experience is variable in space and in time. And so we have different resolution from proxy records of, you know, what life was like in China and what life was like in Chile and what life was like in Rome. And it's very different in those different places. And so that's giving us some resolution into what might be going on at that time. Then the next question, right, is what was Aetna responsible for these changes? And again, that's a spatial question. And that's asking you know, would Aetna be able to produce the effects we see in Rome and in Greece and not produce anything in Tasmania? And so there's variations in sort of laterally across the world. There are also variations uh, depending on the height of particles in the atmosphere. So there are some effects that, you s that are related to particles that you're actually inhaling, while there are other effects that are due to particles in the very upper parts of the atmosphere that are reflecting sunlight. And so you know, our approach was to answer these questions in space and in time, and was Aetna responsible uh, for this distribution of effects? So I think one of the things I thought was interesting about this was that there is this mystery of this large volcano that we see in the ice core record, right? Yes. Tell me about the ice core record and how we know that there was this big volcano around 44 BCE. Uh, so it, in ice cores, we see changes in the chemical composition when there are these really large volcanic eruptions. So these eruptions are large enough that they're, some of their gases, which ultimately turn into sulfate aerosols, are being deposited worldwide. And so we can see these sulfate aerosols recorded in the ice cores. And when we see the sulfate both in the northern hemisphere, so in the Greenland ice core and in the southern hemisphere in an Antarctic ice core, we know this eruption is so large that it's distributing material worldwide. And that's when we start to hypothesize that maybe it had an effect on the climate or made it, maybe it had an effect on ecosystems or people. And these ice cores are generally considered to be so far from any other sources of sulfur that it has to be coming from the atmosphere. And when you think about what's coming from the atmosphere, uh, really volcanoes end up being one of the only sources. In modern times, one of the largest sources of sulfur are cars, but thankfully in 44 BC, that's not a problem for us. They <laughs> yeah. didn't have cars back in the late Roman Republic, so we're not uh, confused by the signal. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that was a good point. And also, just to sort of add on that, we have some examples where, uh, for instance, for the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption, as well as other eruptions like the Tembora 1815 and the Krakatoa eruption, where we know that there was a really big eruption and then when we look in the ice cores, we see a consequent increase in the sulfate aerosols. So that, that provides some confidence that this idea that you can go to the ice cores with very high resolution, with we, where we can resolve things almost on yearly time scales, uh, and seeing sulfur there, that corresponds to large volcanic eruptions happening worldwide. Um, there's actually a little bit of a puzzle so the largest eruption of the 20th century was Novarupta, which was in Alaska, and it produced this giant eruption. <laughs> and pretty much no climate effects, as far as we can tell. And in 1991, uh, there was an eruption that was smaller and produced dramatic climate effects, including people estimate maybe a, almost a 10% drop in crop yields globally. 
And so one question that people have had is, you know, why do some volcanic eruptions produce effects and why do some others not? And we think that probably that answer is intimately related with sulfur. Okay, so this invisible sulfur that's coming out of the volcano could have these profound global exactly. effects on climate because what yeah. effect does it have in the atmosphere that changes the way crops might grow or the temperatures we might be experiencing on the ground? So the main effect with regards to sulfur from large volcanic eruptions is that large volcanic eruptions can put sulfur not just uh, in the lower atmosphere but high, up, high above in the stratosphere, tens of kilometers up. And because in the stratosphere uh, you get you get all the sulfur, there's no sulfur in general. Uh, there's not much le much less sulfur. It forms sulfate aerosols, which reflect off sunlight much more efficiently than before. As a result, you get a cooling effect, which is the traditional effect that we see in for Mount Pinatubo and other big large eruptions. You also get an effect because you're uh, reflecting off sunlight. Plants. It's been hypothesized that plants as a result get lower radiation uh, and that affects their crop yield. Um, so there's a number of effects and if the volcano does not put uh, sulfur high up in the atmosphere because of water vapor in the lower atmosphere, the lifetime of sulfur is much shorter of the order of weeks. If you put it high enough, there's not enough water vapor to convert it into sulfate aerosols rapidly and then the sulfur can persist for multiple years and produce global signals rather than very local signals. Also to clarify with respect <laughs> to the plants, when we say irradiation, we mean light in this context, Sorry, yes. not, <laughs> like, uh, no, not anything else. <laughs> Good clarification. Okay, so when you drill down into the ice in the Arctic or the Antarctic, if you've had a very large eruption, you can see the signature at the time that this ice was put down as snow and and it tells you something about how big that eruption was compared to the ones that we know about because we've seen them and experienced them here today and so you saw this signature that happened in 44 BCE or around then which was right around the time that that Caesar was murdered it's notable in, <laughs> in our history um, how big does that signature look compared to some of the eruptions we might be more familiar with like Krakatoa or like Helens or Pinatubo Right. <laughs> so with regards to the sulfur signal that we see in the ice cores, um, it's the, the eruption in 44 BC is uh, either the third or the fourth largest in the last 2,500 years of ice core records. It's about one and a half to three times larger than the 1815 Tambora eruption, which is associated with large-scale global effects, including the year without uh, summer in, in Europe and a lot of other history as aspects with it. Coincidentally, the year without a summer may be responsible for the writing of the Frankenstein <laughs> novel. <laughs> yes, I've heard about that. Isn't that amazing? Like, yeah. Fun. <laughs> um, and it's, I think, about, uh, it's, it's something like five to ten times larger than the Mount Pinatubo eruption, which has been associated with, uh, with some potential high indices in global warming in the modern era. So it's a really large eruption, and we don't know where it is. <laughs> the other really big eruption that people like to put things in context um, is Ben Franklin was hanging out in Paris in 1783, and there was a large eruption in Iceland, and people have modeled that. That's called the, the Lockheed eruption, and people have linked that to the, the French Revolution and uh, models where people say, you know, how many people in Europe would have died just due to the respiratory effects of breathing all that terrible air. And I think 150,000 people died probably within wow. a few years of that eruption. So it was a really hard time. Crops failed. There was snow in the summer. And but you wouldn't have necessarily known at that time that, that the illness you were experiencing was from this volcano in Iceland. Exactly. And the peak that we see after, that we're arguing is due to Mount Etna, is twice what was observed after that 1783 eruption. So we're talking about a really large anomalous event. Okay, so mysterious eruption somewhere in the world at this time. The ice core tells you when, but not yes. where, because it's a, a global signature. Yes. So, or I can tell you a little bit about where, not very specifically, but since there is a much or there is a larger anomaly in the northern hemisphere, so in the Gre Greenland ice core, uh, we infer that it's probably somewhere in the northern hemisphere. Though you also see it in Antarctica. Okay, so it can narrow it down to northern hemisphere. Still a big area. Yeah, northern right. hemisphere. Fair. And it has yeah. to be 
mid latitude or close to the equator so that most of the sulfur doesn't just end up in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so now you're kind of narrowing it down. <laughs> right. Your question <laughs> of where it might be. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. And Etna falls within that possibility band. Yes, mm -hmm. Etna does fall within that possibility band. All right, let's talk about where Etna is. It's in the Mediterranean. It's in Sicily. It's centrally located in the Roman Republic, which is the, the spatial scale that we actually care about during that time period. So if you imagine the Roman Republic was this incredibly diffuse, uh, Morgan, I'm sure, talked about this, but it goes from Spain to Turkey. And most of the agriculture and most of the food is coming from Egypt and Turkey. And so mm -hmm. Etna is dead in the center of that whole, uh, of that whole republic. So it's kind of situated to impact all of the republic, potentially, depending on the way the wind is blowing, maybe. Exactly. And it's, it, it's, it's about 800 kilometers from where Rome is. And depending on where the winds are, are, are moving, it, it can either, either have material directly going over Rome, or it can, have, it can have material that moves more over the Mediterranean and then cycle back towards Rome and the larger Italy. So we knew there was an eruption this year because people wrote about it. Um, and we know from the ice core that there was a big eruption somewhere in the world. Uh, why had people not connected these before? Why didn't they think it was Edna? Well, so some pioneering work in the 80s had looked at classical sources and looked at where, at these times when people had observed eruptions and had documented bad things happening and uh, tried to go from those eyewitness accounts back in, in history to try to say how big eruptions were. And there was a pioneering classic study in the 80s which said, well, you know, maybe these two, maybe the things that people were seeing in Rome was related to this eruption that people had observed. One reason I think it's been difficult to, in the past, to, to sort of a, a address this problem is there weren't a lot of records globally and the resolution and time of those records was quite coarse. And so a large sulfur anomaly, plus or minus 20 years, is a lot less easy to attribute than plus or minus one year. And so these, these advances in modern, in modern proxy records and that sort of new norms about letting data be publicly available have really let, sort of opened up the, uh, a whole new world of being able to look at these sort of ancient eruptions. Mm -hmm. Also just advances in ice core dating, which is kind of what Noah's getting at. So that's only within maybe the past 15 years that we've known exactly when this anomaly happened. Okay, so you could narrow in. The, the, there was exactly. no anomaly, but this is getting closer to the when. And this is actually one of the big contributions that Raphael made is that, you know, people had speculated that there might be a connection, but we treated that as a testable hypothesis. And I think that's also a sort of novel approach so basically they have all this kind of um observational data mm -hmm. like the ice cores mm -hmm. and all that stuff and then they have the historical information right, that they yeah. have but they need to like put this together yes and they do that using a model right using a model yeah yeah so what the model tried to do is look at wind patterns and say if the volcano erupted here would the gases and particulates go to the right place to have the effects that were observed historically right so like at the right times um, and so they don't know where the wind was blowing 2,000 years ago we didn't have those weather stations but we know a lot about our weather over the last century so basically they kind of used the wind patterns from the last century and they ran it over a lot of years so that the specifics of that year wouldn't matter so much to figure out like would the gases blow over Rome at the right time, and would they blow over China at the right time? Yeah, that's the basic idea. Um, like, obviously, we don't have satellite data or atmospheric data for 44 BCE, so we're kind of at a loss there. But we do have good data for, like, the past 70 years. For the entire globe, actually, which is pretty cool, this, this is this huge data set that um, NOAA has put together. Um, not NOAA. Like, <laughs> 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 like the National yeah, yeah, yeah. Atmospheric Association? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that NOAA. <laughs> yeah. uh, so using this, we can, we can pretty much just like run these models wherever we want um, and let them run for as long as we want, and we would be able to track these particles around the entire globe. And we basically just like follow this particle as it's moving along and just see like where the wind is moving it. And we get a nice pretty picture that comes out that tells us where exactly the particle is and um, how high it is. 
And so if you just run this for like a ton of years, you can kind of get a good sense for where the disruption would go. And doing it for so, m so many years kind of gets rid of that like annual and seasonal variation. Um, so that definitely helps us. And granted, it's like 2,000 years later. Um, so you could say that the atmosphere has changed a decent amount. But in reality, like on an Earth time scale, that's not that huge of a change. Um, like the main thing I'd be worried about would be any post-industrial like anthropogenic changes because like that is the biggest change you've seen in the past 2,000 years is like that small few hundred years that we see like that huge jump in carbon dioxide. But realistically, I don't know if that was actually like that huge of an impact. No, yeah, like one. It's yeah. reasonable to think the, the way the jet stream worked and the way the winds were exactly. blowing 2,000 exactly. years ago is um, probably similar. It's a, a short step in geological yeah. time scale. So we, we would start it like on a we I think we picked February 15th because that's what the eyewitness accounts. So the eyewitness accounts generally agree on like February 15th. Like so the that's eruption the, of Edna. Yeah. So okay. that's the day we picked to run it on. And we would do that. We would start on February 15th like every year. And there were different runs that we did. So some runs were shorter and had like a higher resolution when we wanted to look at maybe the impacts that it had over Rome. And then there were some runs that we did that were longer where we wanted to confirm that these particles were actually making it to the North Pole and actually hitting these um, ice core records. Um, but like I said, it's it's every year. We're not like running it for, for 10 years at a time. It's like every year we're doing it for a certain amount of time. Trying different months as well then lets you evaluate what time of year the eruption may have happened. And so we're also testing whether or not it's consistent with it being a February eruption. Okay, so by trying different times of year, you can get an idea of like, it looks right based on the data we do have when you start February 15th, but maybe not so much if you start May 15th or March 15th. Exactly. Do I understand? Exactly. Okay, yeah. exactly. <laughs> because uh, because you, you get you get different seasonal patterns, so that would change the wind patterns. But the starting in different years is more to like get rid of the variability from year to year in the data set you were modeling from? Or, or it's just because like if, if we are in San Francisco, every February 15th or, or, ev or every December 10th, at AGU time, there will be there will be generally some kind of weather, but but depending on if there's a storm or not, the particles would move different locations. So we wanted to look at that and see how different that is. Uh, are we getting completely different answers every year? If that were the case, and that would suggest that this answer this constraint is not very strong, versus you're saying okay, on general, on an average, this is the wind pattern, uh, and this is where stuff is going in February. This is where the stuff the particles are going in November, for instance. And did you see a lot of variability from year to year? Yeah, th so there was a decent amount of variability from year to year. Um, mostly what I was looking at when I was doing these is trying to see if the scattering would tend towards like the, the east and actually hit China to create these like crop failures that we were seeing in those records, and also Egypt. And so February and March tended to, to do that the most. Um, and most other months would, would do some other strange things going in different directions. Like generally northeast was a direction, but how strongly that flow is northeast would vary pretty decently depending on the month. And so is that kind of reassuring that because we knew Etna had erupted, because we knew Etna had erupted in February based on historical counts. Is this right? I'm not making things up. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Yes. So we knew, yes. we knew that they knew that there was this eruption in February. And so if you're seeing the wind patterns for that time of year makes sense for the climactic effects and the, the effects on, on crops and agriculture seen in Southeast Asia and China um, at the time and in Egypt, then you're like, okay, it's looking like it makes sense <laughs> versus if, you know, like a summer eruption wouldn't make sense. Exactly. And especially since the ice core record and a lot of the paleoclimate records don't have that kind of resolution. So we can't say from, from those records alone what time of year an eruption was, or even in some cases, exactly which year it was. So like 44 BC works, maybe 45 does too, maybe 43. And Raphael, what did you see when you ran this model? Where are these particles going? So in general, they're moving towards the east, which is where we're seeing these effects on the crop yield records. And then the other thing we were looking for was actually the height of the particles. Um, as Tushar mentioned earlier, we actually care about whether or not these particles are making it to the stratosphere because that changes how long they're up there and, and what kind of effects they have. And so actually a kind of interesting challenge with that was actually deciding where the stratosphere was because that also changes actually like mostly spatially. So that's good for us because then we don't have to worry too much about the, the time. 
Um, but it was kind of important to make that distinction and say like, okay, over Italy, this the stratosphere generally starts about here. Also, oh, that's not like a like a set point. It's not exactly yeah. sixty <laughs> kilometers or like how high is the stratosphere usually, and does it move around? It, so yeah, it, it's not set. It does uh, change, and the reasons why it varies are actually pretty complicated. But in general, we have a good sense for for where it's supposed to be spatially. Um, so generally, it tends to be pretty high in the equator. And then it, it gets like lower as you move up. Um, so I want to say like 10, 10 kilometers plus or minus five. So the approximate boundary between the troposphere, the lower atmosphere, and the stratosphere, the upper atmosphere, is going to be where most planes are flying. So if you've taken a plane, you've flown in that boundary layer. Oh, is that because it just has to do with like the lift that the plane is getting? To my understanding, that's just where it's the most stable or like calm. Because exactly. uh, it's yeah, it's yeah. kind of that it's like that cloud boundary layer, and so you don't want to be like flying in the mess. The the stratosphere tends to circulate very like peacefully, and and that sort of stable ish layer is also why it can sometimes be difficult for particles to actually cross that boundary, and so that's one reason we really needed to test that, and make sure yeah. that the particle distribution uh, was consistent with observations. Yeah, yeah. So just to kind of like put it all together and paint a full picture. We're looking for the the lower atmosphere particles to, to linger around Rome, like the Roman Republic the most, and cause effects there on the ground. And then we're looking for a decent amount of particles to be able to cross over to the upper atmosphere and the stratosphere and travel far enough to cause the, the crop yield uh, failures that we would see and also cause these effects that we see in the ice core records. There's no rain in the upper atmosphere, so they can transport farther. So that gives you some that gives us some ideas in terms of ge geographical location where eruptions need to be if you wanted to cause effects of people living on the ground directly versus if you wanted to just have larger optical phenomena and global scale effects. What did this eruption at Etna in 44 BCE look like compared to you know other eruptions we might be familiar with? Was it really explosive? Were there people? I know we, it was effects were recorded in Rome, but that's pretty far away. What about people closer? Did they see it? And was there a reason to think it wasn't that big an eruption? Maybe we were a little surprised at the effects that it had globally. So the answer to this is going to be really disconcerting, and I'm sorry about that. One thing you might ask is how large of an eruption is required to change the climate. And so the way that we measure the size of a volcanic eruption is called the VEI, Volcano Explosivity Index. It doesn't matter what exactly goes into that. But you can, you can compare the size of an eruption based on the ways that we measure that versus the amount of an effect and the amount of sulfur it puts into the stratosphere, and there's no relationship, zero. OK. So I think this goes back to that puzzle that you were actually asking about is and I think this is one reason why people have been reluctant to attribute these effects to Etna, is there was an eruption at Etna, and people saw it, and people, modern geologists can go and they can put their hands on those rocks. And it's not a lot of rock that was produced. What we do know is Mount Etna is one of the most sulfur-rich volcanoes on this planet. Oh, OK. And so the size of that eruption was maybe not as impressive even as uh, Mount St. Helens maybe in it today, uh, but the, it's, a, its effects might it, uh, were much larger than anything we've observed like in modern times. Like the stealth effects of the invisible gas. Yeah, exactly. If you're living really, really nearby, if you're living in Pompeii and Vesuvius ejects a lot of ash, that's really important for people living in Pompeii, and it would look like a really big eruption, and you know it might be really disastrous. But that doesn't mean that globally that will have the same kind of signal because it's a different process. But we think that it, because Etna is known to have a lot of sulfur, when when people look at rocks from Etna in general, and look at the gases either coming out directly uh, or look is look at the gases that are recorded in small capsules um, in the magma as melt inclusions or inclusions of or, or little bubbles, you find that it is very rich in sulfur compared to a lot of other volcanoes. So we think that because of that, it may have been much more sulfur rich than a typical eruption. Now this is, you know, we haven't gone and done the work of looking at those deposits yet. Um, and that's something that can be tested. So this is an idea that, you know, we, we're basically saying, Look, it's very consistent with where all the effects are happening. 
and all the records are. And it, ho our hope is that you know this this work would help focus people to go and look at those deposits more carefully, try and quantifying more and look at those properties to see whether was it as sulfur rich as we think it needs to be or was it not. Sulfur is an invisible gas. However, it's not invisible to satellites. So we can actually see Etna emitting sulfur all the time right now okay. from satellites. So we, we know this is a process that's happening. And we know that Etna is an enormous emitter of sulfur. One question of interest is why are we interested in some volcanic eruptions versus others? And it makes sense that Mount Vesuvius is incredibly charismatic. We see the people painfully dying as they're smothered in ash. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right? Th that's part of why we're interested in, yeah. in it, is it, it is very visual, and it produced almost no sulfur on record. This is, you know, we have this outsized view of this incredibly small eruption. And similarly, Mount St. Helens was a very small eruption, but it had a, 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 an effect on people's lives, and so that's why we remember it. Mount Etna in 44 BC maybe was not quite as charismatic as some of these other eruptions, but it had a much larger effect. And maybe underappreciated. Underappreciated effect. So, you know, the ancient sources described all these environmental effects, and I think those have been largely discounted by subsequent work. And I think that's partly because people are like, you know, the Romans are super superstitious, and they had all these weird political biases and made them tell a bunch of lies. And in some ways, our work is more in line with ancient sources than the historic, than the 2,000 years of historical record that have followed. <laughs> we just, we underappreciated their direct reporting on what was happening. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems like the way things were written up and history was reported, reported, sure, that uh, it was almost too fantastical or too out there, far-fetched to believe be believed yeah but they should have at least like we, we should have taken this history into consideration and thought it was accepted as truth at least in some capacity yeah i guess you could say like the things that they were reporting that were like pretty accurate were maybe hidden among things that seem more fantastical like mm -hmm. for example you know we read we heard that poem earlier about the darkened skies that sounds like pretty realistic right, right? so there's this other poet who's also talking about darkened skies but then the poem takes a funny turn okay so actually this is one of my favorite authors Tibullus also writes about how the sun sort of stopped shining for this year ipsum etiam solum defectum lumine weedit jungere palentes nubilus anus equos et lacra deum lacrimas fudice tepentes Fata que vocales primonuise boes. The gloomy year saw the sun itself without light, uh, and it yoked its pale horses. So this is the idea that you know the personified sun isn't shining anymore, and oh wait. Give me a second. Yeah. <laughs> Are you translating in the moment? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second couplet just gets into like weird cow stuff. Weird cow stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you stick with the first couplet. Maybe it just like stick <laughs> with the sun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so they're, they're close observers of nature, and so they they sort of wanted to read into all kinds of things that happened. So like when you know shit hit the fan, they would sort of look for. Uh, what they called prodigies, sort of like weird things that happen in nature. Uh, and that could be like your cows start talking like humans <laughs> or lightning strikes, you know, a mausoleum or, you know, really bad hail or the sun gets blotted out or a cow is born with two heads. Um, all of these things are like useful information for understanding sort of like where you stand with the gods. Yeah. Um, it's like godly commentary right. on, on what, uh, what people do down here are, yep. are doing. And they're kind of like, yep. blotting this guy out. Maybe we're not really down with right. That's, something is not right. Yeah. Um, but they also do group like talking cows in the same, <laughs> same broad category. <laughs> that would be surprising. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a little bit, a little bit strange to modern sensibilities. I mean, I don't know. I, I, 
I wouldn't mind talking to a cow. Yeah, I wonder Saying, what cows think. Right, exactly. This is totally, totally believable. <laughs> <laughs> so you can kind of understand why they were like, you know, historians looking at this are thinking, well, this is all very metaphorical. Right, right. They're not going to yeah. piece through the ridiculous stuff to find the, the kernel of truth in there. No, I understand. I get it. I've been friends with Noah for a long time, and we love talking to each other about our research. And, you know, we both work a lot on sort of things of the past. Uh, geolog- that's actually you know, something that classicists and geologists share in common, that you, we actually are both interested in the past, and geologists actually are oftentimes interested in the much deeper past. <laughs> um, like, I thought I knew this, you know, so much of what there was to know about this period, and I hadn't even, you know, stopped twice to think about this eruption. And does it, looking at it from, you know, a different discipline's point of view, give you different ideas about the thing, the, the sources you're studying and what you're thinking about? Absolutely. I think, you know, thinking about, you know, I think it's so easy to fall into sort of human dominated narratives of history. And, you know, who can blame you, right? I mean, humans are fascinated, you know, we're, we as humans are fascinated with ourselves, right? <laughs> uh, we love the Game of Thrones, <laughs> you know, narratives. And so I think to, to take a step back and think about, you know, how would we think about these years if we were telling the story not about, you know, human agency and maneuvering, but about, you know, this, you know, catastrophic environmental disaster that happened for several years, you know, that there's you know, a very different narrative that you can see in this time period if you look at it from a different angle. And even, you know, you can put the humans back into it, you know, as we were talking about, the, the lived experience is really different if you're thinking about it, not just like, my general died, but my general died, and now I can't breathe, and I can't see the sun. You might ask why Virgil chose to write a four-book poem about farming. Why did he write a four-book <laughs> poem about farming? <laughs> It's a really good question, right? And it's one that I think, you know, scholars still wrestle with. Uh, and there, there are lots of reasons that you can talk about. But, you know, maybe one reason that we could be talking about is that actually the natural world felt really unstable. That the question of how you, you make stuff grow in a consistent, you know, and like, you know, create sort of a stable life and relationship with the land and the world around you felt really tenuous if i'm understanding this right virgil is virgil 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 Virgil. i think i don't know anyways is more (laughs) we're gonna get all kinds of pronunciation things is more famous for the poem the aeneid yeah i mean i've heard of it could not i don't think i read that though no that's not one of the things you have read no You're, you're a voracious reader would you have did you would you read his four book poem about farming perhaps would that be one of your desert or your um my your, desert island reads? Desert island re- <laughs> We're gonna have to go back and edit one of our podcast episodes to add that to it. <laughs> all right, well, uh, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much to Liza for bringing us this story, and of course, thanks to Morgan, Raphael, Noah, Isabel, and Tushar for sharing their work with us. This podcast was produced by Liza and mixed by Kayla Surrey. We'd love to hear your thoughts on our podcast. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can find us there or wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, always at thirdpodfromthesun.com. All right. Thanks all. And we'll see you next time.